welcome to Story and Song Bookstore Bistro. I'm Donna Paz Kaufman, owner of the Bookstore Bistro here with Rebecca Kano, who you'll oftentimes see up front and even in the kitchen. <laughs> and we are so pleased to welcome from Hilton Head, South Carolina, Beverly Bowers Jennings. Today's talk is about shrimp. What a perfect time of year. It's all on our minds, right? We're ready for Shrimp Festival to return to the island, but it doesn't mean that we can't celebrate in the meantime. And when Beverly, you sent me the book earlier this year, I think it was in January, I got this lovely, lovely table, coffee table book. And for weeks, I went through that, the chapters at night, reading the history, looking at the beautiful photos, many of which came from the Amelia Island Museum of History, and then looking at recipes. It's a fabulous book. It's rich and wonderful on lots of different levels. And we're here today and tomorrow to talk with Beverly about the shrimping industry and about shrimp. So today, we're going to start with food, shrimp as food. And um, you mentioned in your intro, Beverly, that the book isn't really about shrimp. It's about people and places. Yes. So say a little bit about, it seems pretty soulful about the experience of researching and writing. Um, tell us more. The shrimpers were so wonderful to me. They opened their photo albums. They told me their stories. They let me come back multiple times. And this was an extension of his exhibits that I had done for the Port Royal Sound Maritime Center in Okatee, where I have the history of shrimping, crabbing, and oystering. A lot was not a lot written about them. Mm. And I filmed it for that about 35 shrimpers, created some videos. And then I had this material and decided it would be really fun to continue and they were very excited that they were going to be in this book. And each one would tell me what, what was something very unusual that they found or why they loved so much being there. They, one of the wives said, Jack must have loved what he was doing because he got up at 3.30 in the morning. But he said every day was like a present, the sunrise, and when they pull the nets up, they get what mm -hmm. it was like presents in there. And they were their own bosses. The stories so, must have been incredible. They wonderful stories. Oh. And they're just wonderful friends. That that is the big thing to me. I'm giving all the proceeds to the South Carolina Seafood Alliance because that is the platform that the shrimpers have to try to fix the waters. Um, deal with politicians, government, media, um, by having a, a group of them organize and, and discuss their, their issues. Mm -hmm. So it's a natural thing that they've done something for me, so I want to do something for them to help preserve mm. their history. It's a labor of love, mm -hmm. obviously, and so is cooking for family. Yes. <laughs> so I had a question. In the book, you give great recognition to many of these families who really made the seafood industry what it is today. And I was wondering if there was a certain family or person that you found the most interesting and couldn't really get enough learning about them. That's a great question. I actually, there are two people. Mm -hmm. One is a young man. He was a young man when he was about 22 years old, big, very, we would call him like a football build. And he was, he's a shrimper, was a shrimper on Hilton Head. His family, the Jones family was doing very well. They had several boats. And unfortunately he got hit by a rare meningitis. In 45 minutes, he went from being totally healthy to he's confined to a wheelchair and a breather. But, and he's the first person I interviewed. And he has been so incredibly supportive, given me names and called people. And it just, I just, I love him. And I yeah. enjoy stopping by to visit him. And, and I, I feel that we've had a wonderful relationship. Mm -hmm. and, and then there's a 
all the families that, mm. that I have, but the, the other one would be the Majoni family. And they're from Savannah and Angela and I have become good friends. Mm. She's a puppeteer and her husband was a yeah. shrimper and an oysterman. Oh. And he's Roddy Beasley who did the, um, the shrimp and rice instead of shrimp and grits. And that mm -hmm. was his recipe. And he kind of threw the things in. We tried to clean it up just a little bit. <laughs> but uh, he, she's just been very, very supportive to me, uh, me, given me a tremendous amount of her family history. And the Ambos is a, a lovely family in Savannah. Also, they both um, celebrated over 50 years in, in the industry this year. Wow. No, 150, sorry. Wow, yeah. wow. many generations. Yes, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. So those, I would say those two, but I can't, not, the, all the others are wonderful too. Did you find some common elements among the family members? Well, or the, from the, between the families? Well, I would say yes, they are all very supportive of each other. Mm. And one of the shrimpers could be out there having a catch of a lifetime. But if a fellow shrimper was in need, he'd dump his catch and go to help them. Mm -hmm. They didn't divulge where their favorite grounds for shrimping were, mm -hmm. but they always had each other's back and helped each other's, the family helped each other. And, and they, um, when they were building a boat, they'd help launch it. They're a very caring and giving and supportive group. And, and the wives, are very supportive of their husbands because they might be out for a while yeah. and come back. Mm -hmm. and so there, yeah, there's a bond there, a strong mm -hmm. bond. Interesting. So how often when you were out interviewing the shrimpers on the boats, mm -hmm. did your interviews happen actually on the shrimp boats? Sometimes they did. Sometimes um, I've been out shrimping. Uh, I went out with um, uh, one of the shrimpers from McClellanville, who sadly um, we lost in October in a very sad accident, mm -hmm. uh, not on the water. Mm -hmm. and, and he was just fabulous, gave me so much information and, and support. And I love going out, went out the blessing of the fleet with him, went out fishing with him or shrimping with him. And I've been out with several others. I, I would interview them wherever they would Talk. talk to me. <laughs> <laughs> and so how often would they start talking about food or food mm -hmm. events? Because, you know, you think of, well, what's the purpose of it all, right? Is mm -hmm. to, is to eat, to survive. Mm -hmm. And we're fortunate enough mm -hmm. in this time in history, we don't lack for food. Most of us mm -hmm. don't lack for food. So here, the mm -hmm. abundance of the sea, do people just kind of tell you their favorite recipes? Mm -hmm. Oh, some of them would, if, if I, you know, if I asked them, they would like Sonny Gay gave me his mother's mother's recipe for pickled shrimp. And Wally Shepherd's wife, she was very involved in the Mount Pleasant area. And she, she ran several events that were around food. So she gave me, Phyllis gave me wonderful information and some recipes. And, and then I asked people, I would say, you know, what, what, did you have a favorite recipe or, um, and they didn't talk as much about the recipes, except um, Jack Chaplin's wife, Sally. She said, well, Jack loved to cook and people loved his food. And whenever he was in port, they would come and get on board and have his shrimp burgers. And Jack made his shrimp burgers. He mashed the shrimp by rolling them with a Coca-Cola bottle. <laughs> I love that. At that. And then she said, well, and my mother, she made a shrimp paste. And she's Sally McTeer. And people in the Buford area know about Sheriff McTeer. He was quite a character. He did voodoo and um, he was a great hunter. And he had a lot of... Uh, character, unusual characteristics, but his wife, I, I guess, if you were having a cocktail party or party, you wanted to have um, Mrs. McTeer's shrimp paste. So would you spread that on a cracker? Yes. Or, so it was more yes. like a pate? It was or? like a pate, yes. Mm -hmm. So what would she put in this? Oh, shrimp paste. 
It's in the book. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. It's been a while since I've gone through the recipe, but it's in the book. And it's also, I believe, in Charleston, in, in the Charleston cookbook, the, the green and white one. Okay. She's, uh, this was highly sought after according to, to salad. It sounds like a, a, a really sophisticated way to use shrimp that I have never had. Have yeah, shrimp no, paste? And no. then also in Buford would be Charles Gay. And he was on the Food oh. Channel with his, um, what he called frogmore stew. And there are I many that people- from the book. Yes. Yeah. But it wasn't, it wasn't actually frog, well, right? Well, Frogmore is a town. That's right. Uh, That's Helena's right, because I didn't know that. Okay. And he had some friends and they were, they were making, uh, they, they came to eat and they were trying to figure out what to do. So he just started throwing things in the pot. And they said, well, what is this called? And supposedly his brother said it's Frogmore Stew. But it has <laughs> low country boil. There, there are lots of different names for it. Okay. But uh, he produced it behind um, his, uh, at his docks and was on the, the channel. Wow. Yeah. There's something about the food and its authenticity. Yes. And that's yes. my, that was, I think, the, the reason why I wanted to ask that question for the people who, who do the shrimping and 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 know what's involved? There's a greater appreciation, right? When you're a farmer, when you raise animals, or or are any part of our food system, of sacredness that comes with um, farming shrimp and using shrimp, shrimp and enjoying them and not wasting shrimp. Right. Right. Would they use every part of it? Now, when we go and get a shrimp at um, Atlantic seafood, which you'll mm -hmm. see tonight at our, mm -hmm. our shore, um, they give you the shells. Right. Mm -hmm. Now, I grew up in Michigan. I have no idea what to do with those oh. shells. <laughs> well, the oh. shells are wonderful, particularly if you're making stock. One thing that uh, Roddy Beasley used to do is he used to take the shells when he was making his um, shrimp and rice, and he would brown the, the shells. He would crisp them up in a saucepan. It with some oil or butter? A little bit, but not a lot. Pretty much just dry to crisp wow. them up. And then he would make the stock. And whether he put vegetables in it mm -hmm. or he just would um, put, uh, you know, some onion and celery, but um, he would make the stock and it, it just makes it richer. Mm -hmm. And there's some people who, who cook with, they'll put the shells in a bag in when they're making a jambalaya or something. And then they can pull that out like a spice bag. Oh, it, um, it, 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 it adds yeah. a little more richness to it. Mm -hmm. And plus, we yeah. don't waste. No, we don't Everything waste. Everything is used. Mm -hmm. No, one of the things that um, they warn you about is if you're marinating shrimp, particularly if you're leaving the heads on or um, you haven't on the bigger ones, you don't devein them or something, that uh, you wouldn't reuse the mar that marinade if you want to use the marinade recipe later on when the shrimp is cooked, you should take out a section of it that hasn't been with the raw shrimp mm -hmm. okay. and the other because it could be fluids okay. from the body, particularly if the heads are, heads are on. Yeah, food contamination. Yeah, that would, would go into the marinade and, and you should you know, just mm -hmm. throw, throw it away. With the shrimp, mm -hmm. this, might, I don't, this might seem like a silly question. No. For, so I'm from the New Orleans area mm -hmm. and so I'm more used to crawfish, even though I do love mm -hmm. shrimp. And with crawfish, when their tails are straight, it means they were usually dead before mm -hmm. you, they were cooked. So oh. we'll, we'll always, it's like a don't eat the dead ones type thing. <laughs> we're all dead, you know? Uh, so it's just better not to eat those, but you still can. And I didn't know if shrimp were similar in well, that way. Well, I've never heard about the tails being out, but one thing, St. Charles Gay, um, was explaining to me one day because um, a customer was not wanting ice with his raw shrimp. Mm. And Charles said, I won't sell you that shrimp unless you go out of here with it on ice. And he said, if you put a plastic bag on your hand and you go outside and you, and you tighten it and you go outside, particularly in the summer in the heat, your hand's going to start to sweat. If you take the shrimp out of here, you tie the top of the bag and you're driving home, the heat is going to start to spoil them. And shrimp that is slightly pink or pinkish that is really raw is spoiling. Oh. You want a shrimp that doesn't have much odor, 
uh, that's firm, if it has um, like an ammonia or chemical, that is a sign that it's starting to go bad. So you mm -hmm. look for what colors? Well, in our area, we have the white shrimp and the brown shrimp. Mm -hmm. Now, when you get down to Key West, they have a whole different kind of shrimping. Mm -hmm. They've got pink shrimp. Right. But their water is so clear, they can't shrimp during the day. They have to shrimp at night. So that's a, a very different um, environment. The, but but the, um, and the, there was, there's a kind of a cute story. Um, someone was visiting and asked them, a friend of mine, how do you tell if the shrimp is good? And they explained that, you know, if it's white or if it's brown, it's good. But if it starts to turn pinkish, then it's not good. So the next day they saw him, they said, well, how is your shrimp? Oh, they said, we had to throw it away. We cooked it and it turned pink. <laughs> <laughs> so details, they, details. Yeah. they forgot to tell them that, yes, that was a good oh, thing. Oh, and when, no. when, we're, when you're asking about the tail, there's another thing. You don't want to cook the shrimp too long. Mm -hmm. You want them to be firm. But they say that if you hold it upside down and you pull the tail, if it flips back, then it's cooked. Okay. Well, interesting okay yeah well okay so before we cook the shrimp let's let's spend some time on that okay because you want okay. i have this little gadget yes and a if, those of you who Feel have it. lived here on the island for maybe 15 or more years you'll remember that wonderful little shop we had old south yankee and um so i bought this on the the recommendation of karen miller and you would hold the headless shrimp correct the mm -hmm. open part and go uh, uh, up here, over the top. Here, up over the top of yes. the shrimp. Yes. Or actually the opposite way. No, no. From this way. No, oh, I, oh, yes, that's yeah, right. Yeah, from the head, head to Sorry. the tail. Yes. So from the head to the tail, and you would take off that shell in one piece, which I which I get. And yes. you also get a good part of the vein, vein. Yes. that way. Mm -hmm. But I never take the time to clean the vein on the underside of the shrimp. Is that necessary? And just no, talk, really. uh, talk um, in general about mm -hmm. cleaning shrimp and what is it with this peachy colored, big fleshy vein that we see sometimes mm -hmm. instead of the black veins? You ever mm -hmm. seen that? Oh, that's sometimes it's really that could be gross. the beginning of the eggs. Oh. That could be the beginning of the eggs. Okay. Because the eggs um, do come in this time of year. Yeah. Okay. But that that's a good way to do it. To, to peel. A lot of people like it. I've never been very good at it, but it it is a it is a good way. So do you get yours pre-cleaned? No, no, you no. Pick no, them I up do, clean. You no, do I do them myself. I do them myself. Yes. <laughs> with your hands. No, no gadgets. No, I do it with my hands. Do you yeah. clean that under vein too? No. No, just the, 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 the back. The small and the medium shrimp, you don't really have to take the vein out. It's very small. Mm -hmm. And the the larger and the jumbos, uh, it's more a cosmetic because it's it, it the way it looks is could bother some people mm -hmm. but it's really it, you don't have to take that one out mm -hmm. but, uh, mm -hmm. interesting yeah. okay yeah that is interesting because again crawfish sorry yes. oh, no 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 i know <laughs> but, crawfish okay okay oh, yes. when i was younger mm -hmm. i never cared at all about mm -hmm. the vein i didn't i didn't mm -hmm. even cr quite know what it was and then even right. when I was told, I was like, well, oh, I can't taste it. And it still tastes yes. like seasoning is good. <laughs> so I didn't care. Put enough seasoning. You yeah. don't even see the vein. Yeah. And then with the crawfish, it. you're sucking the head and the guts out. <laughs> and it, was, it yeah. tastes wonderful. So, you know. Well, it's been boiled. It's exactly. sanitized. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah. Do you take the heads on? Do you buy with the heads on? Uh, yes. Well, sometimes I buy with the heads on. Sometimes I don't. When, the, um, when you're buying shrimp, if the head's off, then you about a pound a person is what you would normally um, buy. But if the heads are on, they're a little less expensive, mm -hmm. and you have to get more because of the of the waste from the heads. But mm -hmm. they're they're they refer to shrimp in the pounds. For instance, that uh, there's sixteen twenties. That's a big shrimp because they're 16 or 20 to a pound. Okay. Or they're 21 to 25 to a pound. Or they're 26 to 30 to a pound. So 26 to 30, you need more shrimp to get a pound. Okay. But that's how they refer, refer to them. Oh. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. And also when you are defrosting shrimp, it's better to defrost in the refrigerator than on the counter. Mm -hmm. And also when you marinate, they say it's not as healthy to do, do um, marinate out on the counter. Mm -hmm. And if you need to hurry it, you can run the plastic bag under the water or you can put it in the defrost of your microwave but really to try to do it just a small amount so you still have crystals oh okay Ooh, it's better when you're microwaving not to totally right defrost it but that's just okay ways to, and they last um shrimp um live shrimp are like two to three days you can keep them in the refrigerator mm -hmm. and you can freeze them for six months but you can freeze them for a little longer than that <laughs> yeah well it's such a favorite food here and one of the things that we brought onto the menu last summer was a shrimp salad nice so mm -hmm. just i mean and that's the thing about what we learn about food fresh and local is always a guaranteed win and mm -hmm. so there's always this concern, right? And um, do you go for quantity or quality? And I think a lot of restaurant people are constantly looking at that because we need to pay staff, we have bills to pay. And so economy does factor in and keeping a food, you know, food cost in its proper range will help you not lose your shirt. But I'm, where I'm headed with this, Beverly, is the farm shrimp from abroad. Yes. Oof. That has impacted everybody. And it's what we find in the grocery stores. Um, mm -hmm. When you're shopping, do, do you ever buy at the grocery, buy shrimp at the grocery store? Or do you always go to your fishmonger? Well, um, I go to the Piggly Wiggly in, in Hilton Head and he gets uh -huh. fresh local from Sea Eagle in Beaufort three times a week. Mm -hmm. And then we have a local fish market, but I don't go to the chains and buy um, because most of them it's imported. And they're raising those shrimp in very poor quality yeah. water with cheap help. Mm -hmm. They don't have to pay the help a lot of money. And they typically put preservatives on that fish to, or the shrimp, to keep them from spoiling even yeah. before they freeze them. Or when they're in some of these particularly some of the ponds that they raise them in that's not in a big body of water, they start getting disease and they throw a lot of antibiotics mm -hmm. and other chemicals in there. So it affects the taste. Mm -hmm. It affects the, the consistency of the mm -hmm. meat. Yeah. And it's really not very healthy. Mm -hmm. As I understand it, the United States was not letting China import the shrimp for a while. So what did they do? They sent it to Ecuador and Malaysia, repackaged it and sent it in. The world economy. The world yeah. economy. <laughs> so when our shrimpers all up and down this mm -hmm. Southeast coast, and I love mm -hmm. the fact that your book is, mm -hmm. is broad range mm -hmm. from St. Augustine all the way up um, to the, through, the Carol, uh, through South Carolina, so our shrimpers go out and they could be how many days and what do they do with that shrimp to keep it safe? For well, us we have, back? I've got a typical, um, right off of, of Hilton Head at, at uh, Hudson's on the dock, the Tumor brothers have three boats and two are 65 foot and one, it was, uh, this will be his, his, it was his second fall, um, an 85 foot boat. And they have been, they, they'll go out 25, 30 days. And on deck, they have a huge tank that is has a lot of salt in it. And they put the shrimp in a bag and they flash freeze it. It's so cold, but the, the salt keeps it from freezing. And they dunk the bags in. And these are re refrigerated boats. Yeah. I'll tell you about that in a second. They And they, they take these bags and they go and they put them down in the hold of their shrimp boat in a freezer. So they, those shrimp come out of the water, they're flash frozen and they go down. Immediately. Immediately. That's and why it tastes so good, right? Yes. Even when it's been flash frozen. Mm -hmm. and, and, and when he, oh. he may, when he returns, he sometimes goes different places and a, a truck will meet him and, and they'll ship it. Um, part of it stays mm -hmm. um, at Andrew's um, 
restaurant. That's the deal because the three boats are behind the restaurant. Uh, nice. But in, in a little side thing is the Ambos's in the mid 50s. They did two really fascinating things. One, there was a man who had a market and he had extra shrimp and he started um, freezing it and his customers loved it. But he didn't have the equipment to mass produce this, but his friend, um, one of the Ambos brothers, had distribution of his seafood all over the United States. So they partnered and created Pan Ready and Trade Winds, which are flash frozen um, seafoods. That was in the 50s and shipped them all over the country and you can find them in the, in the freezers and they're, they still are doing. And then they, they branched out with other fish and um, different things. But that, and also the Ambos family in the 50s partnered with um, Mr. Mingledorf, who was a, a distributor of carrier air conditioning in the <laughs> South Carolina area and they created the first freezer shrimp boat, Trade Winds. So no, they no longer had to wrestle with 300 pound blocks of ice, lifting them down into the boat. And in the early days, the docks did not move with the tide. When oh. the tide went out, the boat was down there and they had a set of tongs and they put out a winch and there was one man down there and this big 300 pound block with just a set of tongs, he'd have to put in the area at, in the in the hole of the boat. And when they had caught shrimp, they had this three prong shaver, and they'd ice down the shrimp. So then then they um, started using a grinder, and they would spray, literally spray the chopped up ice into the. Oh, okay. And there's there's a picture out there in Rockville at Cherry. Um, Jerry, help, um, the, the seafood mm -hmm. of the, he has this, these two silos that are his ice making machines. And he's got these pipes that come down and he literally, they put the pipe down in the boat and they shoot the ice into the hull of the, into the cabin. Of the, it sounds like a lot of hard work. Oh, it's really. a lot of hard work. It is. And McClellanville lost their ice machine. So those people either have to go to St. Helena's Island or they have to go over to Rockville. Mm -hmm. Cherry Point. It's Cherry Point. Cherry Point. Mm -hmm. yeah. Wow. So, wow. So wh what do you like to do with shrimp? Oh, I what like do you to, cook. What, what I are like some to, of your favorite dishes? Well, one of my favorite things is the, the tort that my neighbor across the street, who's a chef, and she tested all the recipes for me. But she made this tort and I said, Kim, we've got to make it with, with chopped up shrimp in it. So we do that. And then I have uh, the zucchini that is stuffed with the, the shrimp. Um, and I, I really, I like that one. And I always love shrimp and grits. And the love tour, and talk grits. a lot, well, how does that look? Your recipes it's, don't show us a photo. I'm so sorry. I'm, I'm wondering what, what it, does that look we like? We do it in a mini bread pan, you know, a little loaf oh, yeah. pan. Uh -huh. And you just layer the cheese, you layer the, the pesto, you the sun-dried tomatoes, and you just layer it. Okay. And then she, oh, and she usually puts uh, actually saran wrap inside the little um, mm -hmm. to lift it pan up. so you can lift it up and, and then Matt, you know, puts it in there firmly and then you flip it out because it's upside down. You can upside down it mm -hmm. and then just kind of decorate it a little bit, put some cr crushed up um, walnuts or something on the top. And several layers of shrimp in there or, or usually at least one. At least one layer. One. And, and it freezes beautifully. It, it sounds like it's beautiful to yeah. look at. Most of these recipes really freeze well. The jambalaya freezes well. I think shrimp, shrimp and grits freeze really well. Mm -hmm. And uh, well, I happen to really love love grits. <laughs> so I did not know you could freeze grits <laughs> at <me> all. <laughs> yes. Well, when we when I grew up, my mother was from the south, and we had mm -hmm. big hominy, but we also had little hominy, and my mother would put it in a loaf, like a meatloaf size pan, which she would, we would have it as porridge. And then she would put it in there, put it in the refrigerator. And then another day she would slice it yeah. and roll it in maple and just kind of brown it up a little bit. Okay. Put a little maple syrup on it. Really good. Oh, what reminds me of Italian polenta. Uh, very much. 
very much so yes but on the sweet using it for sweet breakfast mm -hmm. well if you put a little you know fresh maple syrup on it it's yeah oh. but you, you can use it you know as a side to a to a dinner too mm -hmm. you know put put herb you can put herbs in it there's a mm -hmm. lot you can do with, mm -hmm. with it. Mm -hmm. and Where, what grits uh, there are lots of, i mean south carolina you you all yeah. celebrate well, grits you i know, what brand do you use well i go to wadmill island and i like it um he's geechee boy grits and oh. they've sort of uh, they've changed the name to marsh hen um, from and there's a picture of the of the bag of the Geechee boy on top of one of the recipes okay. but i've used that for and he's right there on the way to uh, edisto and lovely lovely family and the it's um a daughter and her husband but the um the father the daughter's father was he was in the shrimping industry and worked for the Majonis, oh. and he gave me a lot of information in fact the Gullah um, dictionary words on every re recipe page came from Gilbert Majoni's Gullah dictionary he made himself and Adair McCoy gave me a copy of it and this is Adair's um, son-in-law and daughter who run this business and it's right on the side of the road and they have they have wonderful different grains and jams and jellies and it's a cute little place you know it's just as you talk about the Gullah Geechee community and f their food ways here in the southeast what a mixing of cultures right because yes. you start the book talking about the portuguese and the italians settling along this coast and really taking shrimp more seriously because prior to that we were just catching and eating whatever we caught right you they ate what they caught but they didn't sell shrimp and when the Sicilians and the Portuguese arrived, they thought shrimp were worms. They'd been feeding them to their stock or use them as fertilizer. And up in North Carolina, they called them bugs. Yeah. Nobody basically ate them. And, and the, except people who needed, they had to eat whatever they could get. Yeah. But as soon as, and there was a lull in shrimping or in, excuse me, in, in fishing. And the, the uh, Sicilians and the Portuguese had all this shrimp but not much fish and they started trying to figure out ways to dry it and can it and encourage people to eat it and then when it start they really started getting a lot they were able to ship it north to fulton's market fulton's is a really really fascinating place and that's in Charleston. That's in New York City. New oh, York. in New York. Oh, of course. Fulton yes. Market. Fulton yes. Market. Fulton Market in New York, Market. Manhattan. Yeah. Yes. And they in the mid 1800s, they brought a railroad spur into Port Royal to get the coal and the the soldiers going over to the Paris Island. There was no bridge, so they would get a boat from there, and that was the second deepest port on the East Coast. So they could bring in these huge <clears throat> hundred ton boats to the um, wharf. And then they had iced rail cars that they could send up. So was it a tipping point, the Fulton Market in New York, in terms of um, people seeing the, the delicious nature of this worm? <laughs> I think that the Northerners had already started eating them some, but um, they it became a lot more popular later on. And I don't think mm -hmm. that the two areas, the South and the North, uh, that they discussed their eating yeah. for, for quite a while. Mm -hmm. It wasn't mm -hmm. so, but Fulton's had everything. Wow. Wow. I'm it's, so sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Rebecca's going to leave to get her second, second shot, shot time. <laughs> it's time for the Fauci out and then yes, you're done. Exactly. Thanks for joining us, Rebecca. No we'll see you so tomorrow. nice to meet you. So um, Beverly, we're going to make, and, and uh, Rebecca is going to pick up some shrimp today. Oh, great. At Atlantic mm -hmm. Seafood, and mm -hmm. we are making jambalaya for a takeout lunch on um, on Saturday in celebration of, of all things shrimp here. Oh. So what would you say are the most common dishes where shrimp is the primary ingredient? Did you see from town to town was there, do you see a sharing of recipes or some kind of Well, unfolding? I think people put their own spin on things. Uh, shrimp and grits is a classic. 
-hmm. example. I mean, some people may put in um, chorizo sausages. Other people may put bacon and tomatoes. Some people may put more of a pancetta in. Mm -hmm. um, and some people might not put a meat. They may just have the shrimp. Uh, so there, people really put a, a, their own twist on a lot. Gumbos. They're all different mm -hmm. kinds. They're brown gumbos, they're red gumbos. And again, that people put their own twist, <clears throat> whether it's just got shrimp, if it's got other fit, seafood in it, if it has okra, doesn't have okra. Mm -hmm. So you see a lot of variety, I think, in the grits, in the gumbos, and in the chipinos, the, mm -hmm. the, the, the uh, different uh, soups or dishes. So I'm, I'm curious, with all of our fascination with chefs and chef shows, now all kinds of food TV programs, we're more conscious of food. We talk about food more. We're more curious about heirloom foods or foods that we are in danger of losing. When you see what's happened along the coast, what do you see specifically with the preparation and presentation and enjoyment of shrimp in some of the better restaurants? Oh, I think that they really, the way they plate, they mm -hmm. make a big effort to have a, a very pleasing plating <clears throat> of what they have prepared. And mm -hmm. also there's a big push for farm to table. And there's an, a restaurant that's about to open um, in Bluffton that's um, a low country gullah. And they are going to be featuring seafood, local seafood that they get, local produce and all local produce. And that's opening in May. That's exciting. Yes. Is that the first Gullah Geechee inspired restaurant you've seen? Well, that is the first um, restaurant and they're gonna have a little bistro in it. But there's a, a chef in Charleston, BJ Daniels, he does wonderful Geechee, Gullah Geechee food. And On he, the high end, is he taken it he, up? Yes, he has. And he, um, he's come and visited Hilton Head. He has um, a friend who's a chef there, Clayton Rollison, and he does things in, in Charleston. And I think Vivian Howard, I was excited mm -hmm. about her new book. She's just opened two new restaurants and, and she does the farm to table and does twists on local local meals. Mm -hmm. So it's, um, it's exciting to see it. It is, and it seems like it's so overdue, right? Mm -hmm. we, we see California, most notably San Francisco, um, enjoying the foods of the Pacific coast. But it's just seemed like recently where the South and the Southeast in particular have really embraced grits mm -hmm. and okra and um, so crowder peas or field peas. Some of the things that you don't find in the grocery store, but mm -hmm. people used to eat. Mm -hmm. And one of our favorite chefs is Whitney Otaka who oh, okay. was the chef mm -hmm. at Grayfield. And oh, she's, yes. she's oh, been okay. asked to mm -hmm. be the signature mm -hmm. chef and to develop the cuisine at a new uh, um, Marriott signature hotel called the Thompson Inn oh. in Savannah. And oh, that's wow. supposed to be happening, some opening Ooh. sometime this summer, which is really exciting Ooh. because that's a two hour drive for us. Oh, I can't you wait know? to hear we that. Can, we can go and, and um, enjoy food and be back on the same wow. night. So, um, and she, she talked when we had lunch here, um, when she, um, her, her cookbook first came out about field peas. Oh yeah, those are great. And so Crowder. it's really exciting, isn't it, to see all these all, all this confluence and yes. the interest mm -hmm. in the farming and beyond the, the seafood, but now the all of the crops. And there I recently there was an article in I think it was Gardening Gun, one of the local magazines, mm -hmm. uh, featuring um, black farmers and their specialty, what they're growing and how they're uh, um, organizing their own cooperatives to to sell their things. And, yeah. yeah. The, in, when you mentioned Grayfields, did you know that, um, I can't think of um, his his first name, but uh, he run, who runs it, he was a shrimper. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's exciting. Gogo's brother. Oh, yeah. Yes. Yeah, the Ferguson's. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. I want well, to say John, but I'm not sure. Yeah, right. I, I, I will have to look that up. 
so um, let's see, what else you want to tell us about food and shrimp and the industry? And well, I think I think I've sort of sort of um, if you want to read more about the the issues of, of um, foreign seafood, there's a Bloomberg business. It was um, December 19 to 25 in 2016, and they wrote an amazing coverage of it. And I think it um, you might people ought to think about the fact that 90% of the seafood that is consumed in the United States is imported. And of that, 89% is aquaculture from Asia and China, and China alone produces 63% of it. So do we not have the capacity? Is there not the stomach for the pricing of what it needs to be? What's that about? Well, I think the pricing is one thing mm -hmm. and hopefully the Alliance is going to get um, maybe better information out mm -hmm. to their in the wild seafood that, um, you know, eat local. It, you know, it's, it's better for you. It tastes better. I think a lot of people don't understand that how much better it is it oh, tastes better. for you yeah it, if, it, if all you've had is grocery store shrimp you don't know you don't know you can't you don't know know the difference yeah it, when um, i go back to michigan i can't eat that shrimp that that no. show up on new year's eve parties there right. so, so tell us about the the south carolina seafood alliance and their goals and um and their, well, their goals for consumer education they're working at consumer education they're trying to um work with uh, the area and particular and the children the, mm. there's a big population in the Beaufort County area of children who have never been out on the water they don't understand the marshes they don't understand the rivers and their programs where they're working with um, various areas like outside Hilton Head to get children out on the water so they can understand they the school groups come into the Port Royal Sound Maritime Center and they try to show them why this land, which is their land, mm -hmm. um, we're something like 45% marsh in Beaufort County wow. and, and very high in all of South Carolina. They need to learn to appreciate, it, embrace it. So more education, mm -hmm. but also having the government and politicians um, aware. Um, one thing that could have been devastating in 1970 was the building of a petrochemical plant on the Colleton River, which is part of Port Royal Sound, with the second deepest area. Um, and this petrochemical plant would uh, potentially provided jobs, but they were all low-level jobs. And the black population really needed work. And their children, it was nationally publicized how poor the health was of these children. But the shrimpers in the 70s and 80s were having very good luck. Mm -hmm. And they had their own cooperative on Hilton Head. They had their own railway. They had their own boats. They were their own captains they had control they'd always worked for white captains but these boats were theirs and they could get repairs and when they came in their families would come to take care of the shrimp and they are the first people who filed a lawsuit against this petrochemical plant that was going to dump 250 million gallons of affluent a day, a day. into the Colleton river and the Colleton river is not a river it's an embayment. There's no headwater that flushes. The tides flush. They did a, um, a research by dumping a case of oranges in the Colleton River. It took two and a half weeks for those oranges to get out of the out. Mm. So if they'd ever had a spill, it would have caused a lot of damage. And the several people from the co-op went out to Texas to look at a petrochemical plant, just like the one they were gonna build, there was nothing they could see that was living. I'm not allowed to say there was nothing living because there might've been a microorganism in there, but it would have really hurt. 
and it's it didn't killed. happen. It, 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 it did didn't not happen. Know. Do you think the threat is still there to our food supply? And well, the food I think industry? it is because um, of, of the way things are being dumped. Mm -hmm. We have to be careful. Um, the marinas, they, they've um, the group the, from Bluffton really, really worked hard um, to not have this happen. And there was national publicity. It was in all the national magazines. Mm -hmm. And finally, they got people to come down and say, can you guarantee you're not going to damage anything and put your money behind it? And they, and they said they couldn't. And, and there were, there'd been a lot of back and forth and the politicians kept trying to push it, push it, push it. Yeah. But thank heavens, it didn't. There was only three miles above Hilton Head. We wouldn't be there. Oh my gosh! And then, then the Hilton Head um, Hack and Fraser, they filed a suit, and Blue Channel Crab in Port Royal, Majonis, and a couple other seafood. They filed the, the third lawsuit. That's a good lawsuit. And a few years that finally that they, they they pulled out, even after saying at one point we're a billion dollar company and we can flush you down the drain but there's um there's a whole chapter on it and i mean this is such an important thing that people don't don't realize yeah a couple of years later chicago bridge and iron tried to build on the same property and halliburton but they were going to have um gas tanks and petrochemicals and this dedicated group in bluffton they fought it my favorite was the four seasons and hilton head got a permit for a pipe to go over the bridge from Hilton Head to the same property, which which is now next to the Waddell Mariculture Center. The center hadn't been built yet. They were gonna send raw sewage to the spot to be treated oh. across a bridge. And the last one was in the uh, late 70s, in, in the 80s, that Baron Boats was gonna build a pleasure craft there. Thunderbolt, the Thunderball and Baron Boats. And again, the Bluffton people rallied and they uh, got the, the politicians were so busy trying to get all the land and push everything through. They neglected to secure the names. And <laughs> one of the local people um, <laughs> created a company of plastic bathtub toys called Baron Boats. <laughs> <laughs> and he, he uh, licensed the name. And he got the phone number for it. And when they heard about it, they were furious. That took a little effort, but big engineering. Oh, it's so cute. This, oh, I love that story. I have an exhibit about all of this at the Coastal Discovery Museum. And one of the people made a little boat, and she gave it to me, a little barren oh. boat. And one Christmas, they had a float in Bluffton with a claw tub. Mm -hmm. And they had the boats in there mm -hmm. <laughs> and the barren boats. Ten dollar plastic boats. Oh, that so. is that's a great story. Mm -hmm. little, little big ingenuity and big results from it. Thank you oh, so much welcome. for joining us. The book is called Shrimp Tales: Small Bites of History, and it is delightful. We'll have Beverly back tomorrow. We're going to talk about the in the shrimping industry. So it will be Bev Beverly with her slides, giving us uh, some years and years of background of the shrimp industry. So thanks for joining us. Oh, we'll see Thank you, you again tomorrow and maybe you'll join us for dinner for shrimp out um, mm -hmm. in Fernandina today. So oh. thanks for joining <laughs> us. We'll see you tomorrow. The book is available at Story and Song. All of the copies will be signed. It's $39.99 and it is well worth it. And all the proceeds go to the South Carolina Seafood Alliance. Eat local shrimp. Eat local shrimp. It's a good cause. Thanks for joining us.